Hi, hello, friends, lovers, and enemies of the Jews, yet again. And speaking of yet again, also filming wigless. I am wigless. As the sun is setting. Um, every time, every time. Very excited about this collab with Charlie, aka Cringy. Charlie and I message all the time about like dumb nonsense that people are saying about Jewish people. And so she reached out to me and was like, hey, let's collab. And since I've never done a collab. Of course I said yes, big excited vibes. We will be putting up a video on her channel soon. Honestly, all of these topics that we're gonna touch on could have had four hour long videos, but um, I'm not gonna do that to you, I'm very sorry. So instead here is a abbreviated version which you'll hopefully stay for the whole thing. You're gonna have to like understand if some things get a little glossed over or if they aren't like as detailed as you might want them to be. Charlie's gonna talk about misconceptions around Judaism as a religion and an ethnicity, like the idea that all Jews are white or that you have to like observe Judaism as a faith in order to be considered Jewish, which like we already know the obvious answers to these things, but gonna let Charlie talk about it. Whereas I'm gonna focus specifically around misconceptions around Israel and Zionism. So without further ado, Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, her. I'm Charlie from the channel Cringy, and I have two myths about Jews that I would like to talk about. But we're going to have to define some terms because this can get very confusing. The first is nationality, which is the status of belonging to a particular nation. And I'll use myself as an example. I am British. I was born in Britain and therefore I am a British national. The second word I want to define is ethnicity. The fact or state of belonging to a social group that has common national or tradition and may also include aspects of shared bloodlines or genetics. Ethnically, I am Jewish. The next term is race, defined as a category of humankind that shares distinctive physical traits as well as culture and or tradition. I am racially white Caucasian slash Chinese. Culture, the ideas, customs and social behaviour of a particular people or society. I can fit into many different cultures. I can fit into British European culture, Chinese culture, and Jewish culture. And then there's religion, the belief and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal god or gods. The first myth that I want to talk about is the idea that all Jews are racially Caucasian white, which refers to European Jews. Ashkenazi Jews are a Jewish population who coalesced in the Holy Roman Empire around the end of the first millennia. These are the Jews who settled in Europe. The majority of the descendants of these Jews are Caucasian, are white, because they are descended from Jews who settled in Europe. However, these aren't the only Jews to exist. For example, the Musrahi Jews, those descended from Jewish communities in the Middle East and North Africa, meaning that these Jews who now exist there currently today are Middle Eastern or African. Sephardi Jews, those who settled in what is now modern Spain and Portugal, Hispanic Jews. And then there are the Kaifeng Jews, a small Jewish community within the Hunan province of China. My descendants are either Mizrahi or Kaifeng Jews. There's no Ashkenazi in there. My white heritage, my Caucasian background, comes from my white, non-Jewish grandfathers. So while Jews across the world share an ethnicity and a common line of blood, we aren't all white. I hope that's clear. The next part is, not all Jews practice Judaism or even believe in a God. Because Jew refers to an ethno-religious group. I would generally simplify Judaism or being Jewish down to three different things. Religion, ethnicity and culture. For example, it's quite hard for people who are not ethnically Jewish or born into an ethnic Jewish family to convert to Judaism. Therefore, the religion or those within the religion are being influenced by the culture that emphasises the importance of ethnicity. If you understand what I'm saying. It's like a chain in a circle, they're all very tightly interlinked. However, it is possible for ethnic Jews to not practice Judaism. In fact, the Hillenim Jews, 
those in Israel are a group of Jews and 40% of them don't even believe in God and view events as cultural events rather than religious. They may see events within the Jewish calendar that relate to Judaism as symbolic and something to bring their community together and to view from a metaphorical stance rather than a literal one. I can say this myself as somebody who does not practice Judaism. In fact, I'm actually pagan. I'm Wiccan. I don't practice Judaism. But I still attend my synagogue, as do many other Jews who don't necessarily practice Judaism, because we see it as a place where we can collectively join together as one with our shared culture and history because as we know Jews have been persecuted throughout the ages and there aren't that many other places that we can gather safely. So for whatever reason there is this nonsense idea that I believe comes from the Goyim that Israel is like a new invention and that it only started existing in 1948. Um, Don't know who wrote that revisionist history, but it's obviously not true. Unfortunately, in order to actually explain the history of Israel as like an idea or as a region, I do have to go to the Bible. I know, I know, boo. So, so according to Midrash Bereshit 38.13, thank you to my job for providing this source because I quite literally could not find it on the internet. Why is the only way to access Jewish knowledge selling your soul to a mega non-profit that's really not a non-profit? I don't know. Why is it that way? Abraham was the son of an idol maker who, like, he might have actually been really high up in the court of the Babylonian king Nimrod, which, um, yes, in English looks like Nimrod. Is that probably where we got that name from? Yes. Have I met real people um, alive in the 21st century also named Nimrod? Yes. Very concerning. Why are you naming your child Nimrod? One day, Abraham shattered all of the idols in his dad's shop, which is basically the ancient equivalent of punching a hole through a wall. Despite the very high unlikelihood that Abraham was actually the first monotheist, the important thing is that he moved to the location that we need to go, that we need to talk about, or at least that's where the narrative arc takes us, like it takes us on his journey. God told Abraham that if he and his wife go to the land of Canaan or Canaan, however you choose to pronounce it. I am American, so it's probably gonna be Canaan the whole time. (laughs) But that if Abraham and his wife moved to Canaan, that God would give them that land and like also to his children. However, as we are well aware, God is a sneaky thief. So didn't quite happen that way. Everyone's always lying to God and God's always lying back at us. We really did deserve it. According to Wikipedia, yes, I am sorry, I am using Wikipedia. I only had time to read one dissertation this week and that one was on patents on menstrual products in the US between 1854 and 1921 but at least it was for an article and all of it was terrifying. Wikipedia basically says that like Canaan, what it like refers to all of the land west of the Jordan River. And also like I mentioned, God didn't end up actually giving that land to Abraham. He gave it to his grandson, um, which is probably a good thing because otherwise it would have been called something stupid like Abraham Vilberg. Basically the important thing is that a bunch of Israelites or people who would later be named Israelites, ended up in Judea and Samaria in the early part of the Iron Age, which began in about 1200 BCE and ended somewhere between 586 and 539 BCE. I'm not gonna go into the intricacies of all of the family structures, so let's just like, the quick and short version is that Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca have Jacob and Esau, but Jacob, is a liar and a sneaky thief. It's, it just continues. And so basically he screws Esau out of his birthright, whatever that even means. Jacob himself, the man, the myth, the legend, wrestles with an angel and gets renamed Israel, which then leads us to the word slash name Israel meaning wrestles with God, which is a hundred percent correct and an excellent way to describe the current Jewish people, because that's like all we do. Jacob then gets to have two wives, not because he's cool, but because his father-in-law is another sneaky thief. 
Who would have thought? It's almost like I said it at the beginning of the video and I've been right this whole time. His father-in-law's an asshole, which is how we have the story of Rachel and Leia and why people now wear veils at their weddings. Meh. However, Jacob did still also have two side pieces, so he probably was cool. He puts these four women through a minimum of 12 sons and a daughter. There's some evidence suggesting that there were more children than that, but only 13 of them got names written down, so. But he put those women through all of that, and for what? Just so that he could have the 12 tribes of Israel? Selfish. And he only liked one of his wives. So then what was the point of these other women? These poor women. Israel and Rachel named their youngest son Joseph, who gets sold into slavery because his brothers cannot stand his Technicolor dream coat. I swear on everyone's life, <laughs> just everyone, just blanket statement, that I have never seen the Prince of Egypt, but I have seen Joseph, King of Dreams, and I have been haunted by this weird little circular dark dungeon that he is in. Cause he's just hanging out there for like, I, it felt like half the movie. I Maybe maybe I'm just m remembering it wrong, but I did rent this movie from Blockbuster and then the next week saw it again in Hebrew school. It's almost like Hashem's been playing tricks on me. Also, every single scene in that movie is like empty for no reason. Like there's nothing in the background. So uh, that scenic designer is canceled. I feel like I'm taking forever, but this is still relevant. Joseph ends up saving Egypt from famine. So then he becomes like the Pharaoh's highest advisor. Um, and I think he like marries a princess, but that might've also only been the movie. Anyways, time brings his brothers to Egypt. Um, and he like gives them permission to immigrate or whatever the ancient version of immigration was. I now interrupt this video with an important message to give you a, an accurate view into what my life is like. My dear friend Sophie, who I mention in most videos, just texted me to ask for an explanation of the connection between hamantashen and vaginas because it's yonic imagery. I'm that person for my friends. But I have just mentioned Purim, which it is today. And what's one month from Purim? Why, yes, it is Passover. Yes, we are now into the time relevant part of the story if you are watching this video around the time it comes out. Basically, so much time passes um, that whoever the new Pharaoh is and everyone else like forgets like the great thing that Joseph and his really gay coat did for Egypt. His coat didn't do anything. Um, I don't mean to mislead you. So, so much time passes that all the other pharaohs forget how Joseph saved Egypt from famine, and so they decide it's time for slavery. So then they enslave all of the Israelites and Passover ensues. And four cups of Manashevitz later, Moses has led us out of Egypt and we now wander the desert for 40 years. Anyways, Jews are never right about how much time it takes to do anything. So I'm gonna assume it wasn't actually 40 years um, and it was just an amount of time. But after we wander around the Negev for a long ass time, God lets us live in the land of milk and honey. And somewhere within all of that time frame, it was not very easy to figure out the actual time frame of all of this. If someone wants to just like literally make a, like make a timeline, that would be awesome. From how we got from Abraham going to Canaan to then the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Personally, I'm working on an extremely long <laughs> spreadsheet, um, keeping track of which episodes of American Ninja Warrior myself and my dad have seen. It's very detailed. I don't have the energy to do that. And then I'll <laughs> the historical research to figure out the actual timeline and geographic moves of the Bible. I'm I'm clearly wasting my time doing other things. So now that you've kind of gotten like the timeline slash like money moves, I mean it's not it's not money moves. What would you call it? Uh, the the pre diaspora, um, mayhaps. So the kingdom of Israel 
slash Samaria and the Kingdom of Judah existed like around the end of the Iron Age, beginning in 930 BCE. A lot of people, mostly religious people, believe that we have an inherent claim to the United Kingdom of Israel that like would have been ruled by King David. However, in 1995 and 1996, the very hot Israel Finkelstein, um, a professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv University, published two papers basically saying that like a bunch of things had been misattributed to the United Kingdom of King David and that that probably didn't actually exist and it was just sort of a literary device slash like kind of made up just to like make things seem nice and wrapped up in a bow, I guess. So like before these papers were published, all historians and archaeologists had kind of agreed that the Iron Age of the Levant was anchored in the biblical account of the united monarchy of David and Solomon. However, while Finkelstein was working on an excavation of two palaces at Megiddo, which is like near Haifa, he realized that there were a lot of problems with like the, what I believe was carbon dating and historical attributions and basically was like, actually I think we really need to like shift the way that we've been previously assuming everything was. That was like a long tangent. I just thought it was really interesting and I ended up on like a two hour long rabbit hole trying to figure out what was going on. Um, so it has to make it into the video. And even though we like can't quite use like the same conceptualization of like the kingdom, the United, the UK, the UK of Israel. The UK of Israel sounds like exactly the kind of country that Charlie would be prime minister of. Regardless, like the connection to the land still is the same because there are all too many accounts of Jews living in that area for that long. Um, and also you can, like there's a lot of evidence of many of the different, different, of many of the different archeological sites and like Egypt is real, Egypt exists. And some of the same, some of the cities still have like the same name. Nazareth exists, Jericho exists, Jerusalem exists. Uh, too bad everyone in the Bible was boring and ugly and did not know how to swim. So none of them were in Tel Aviv. But some of these like archeological sites that like if you are more on the skeptical side or are interested in this like historical placement that I'm trying to like explain to be like, it's been here forever. Israel's been around forever. We've got the first temple. There's like way too many accounts of that. We've got the second temple. Uh, literally the walls of it are, they're still there, still hanging out. Um, the catacombs, which I have been in and I highly recommend. I think that that is way better than any other part of the walls. You've got the stolen menorah that may or may not be in the Pope's basement. You've got King Herod who gave the temple a facelift after he converted to Judaism. You've got literally every other single part of Jerusalem that if you look at it with your eyes screams, yeah, there were some Jews here. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is so mean, but it really does. You've got Masada. You've got a consistent lack of pig bones in any of the locations that were almost positive Jews used to live. You've got Tel Dan, which I think might be why the current state of Israel like kind of, kind of sort of has jurisdiction over the Golan Heights, even though like most people are like, don't know. Like quite frankly, everything that I was seeing online was totally different to what I have what have been told every the three times I've been to Israel. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I have no idea what's going on in the north. And you've got the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron. Yes, this was mostly a list of places that I've been because I wanted to use my fun pictures. We're gonna slip down now into anti-Israel versus anti-Zionism because I know with some of those last ones, I got into some very spicy topics. Unfortunately, Israel has the very cursed predicament of every single important site being right on top of each other. You know, it's not like Gettysburg is an important site in US history and so is DC. No, it's like literally this one cobblestone is where we believe Abraham got his first puppy. And this cobblestone right next to it is where Rachel said, okay, maybe I will marry you after you work for seven years. It's like it all literally is, it's, it's all just one big blob of all being the same thing. What's the point? <laughs> like there are some intricate, intricate 
issues that we probably won't be able to get to, like how Hebron is like in the West Bank and there's a lot of tension regarding that city because of the cave and I, there's got to be something else going on. I don't know. And then Temple Mount is like big problematic vibes. Um, yes, the Prophet Muhammad said, I will step my foot right on top of the holiest of holies. I'm sure that was offensive. Um, he did a jump and God carried him? Question mark. I don't remember. And so now there's a footprint there, I think, because of the stuff that we're going to get to as we continue forward in time, and also the expansion of the Nation of Islam, if I remember correctly. The Temple Mount has been belonging to Muslims basically since, I don't know, since whenever they got there, which is why it's got that really cool golden dome and it's called the Dome of the Rock. That was not a great explanation if you aren't familiar with um, the overlap of importance and like bitter fighting uh, over certain historical sites. Hopefully that helped. It wasn't like Jews just abandoned these important sites. So we all know the Roman occupation. If you don't know, I don't know where you've been. Like who did you think crucified Jesus. It was the Romans. They're always doing the worst. But they basically started the true Jewish diaspora. They desperately wanted to eliminate the Jewish connection to the land, so they renamed the Kingdom of Judah Palestine after our enemies, the Philistines, who destroyed the first temple. Very fun. Definitely not a dick move to name someone's place that they were living after uh, their bitter sworn enemy. They were like, we're gonna change the name of this land so that your grandchildren won't even know that they have a connection to this land. Uh, basically like the evil version of what God did when we left Egypt, you know? So like instead of wandering the desert for 40 years so that when we settle in a new place, our grandchildren don't remember the suffering of being slaves. No, instead you'll never even know you had a home. Ouch, that one hurted. We spread out like all over. Um, some Jews stayed, but not that many, like very much not that many. Most Jews ended up either going to Europe, which, hello, I do have skin as white as milk and a cape as red as blood, not hair as yellow as corn or slivers as pure as gold. Bring me these in three days time. The slipper as white as blood. <laughs> so most Jews ended up going to Europe or what today is called Syria, Ethiopia, and Iran. For the most part, these last three regions where Jews settled, like Jewish people were able to stay for a decently long amount of time and like settle and like actually have communities. Europe is and was riddled with anti-Semites. So basically we would like be one place for like not that long and then be kicked to another place for not that long and then just kicked around. Um, like why is my mind saying bocce ball? Bocce ball is a Jewish game that they force you to play at summer camp. So yeah, they were kicking us around willy-nilly and disenfranchising us and forcing us to live in little ghettos and shtetls and making sure that we could only have certain kinds of jobs. The two main additional kicking Jews out of places things were um, the Spanish Inquisition, which killed about 32,000 people. Um, kind of unclear how many Jews versus how many Muslims. And 200,000 Jews were expelled, and lots of those Sephardic Jews went to the New World, or they went back to the Levant. One of my oldest friend's family members fled Spain to the colonies in Morocco and was eventually born under French rule before immigrating to what was at the time called Palestine, even though like five years later it became Israel. Then she immigrated to the US. So uh, yeah, those immigration records are a mess. <laughs> and a similar thing kind of happened to my 
father's family because his DNA test back and he's like 25% Sephardi, but he thinks it's just Hispanic because he doesn't under he doesn't know. What a tragedy that my father knows nothing about Jewish history. But now like ancestry is like, look at all of these cousins with Spanish names. His side probably just went to the new world. And the other being mean, kicking Jews out of places they were living was um, obviously the 18 to early 1900s um, when Jews were emancipated. Hey! And so we didn't have to keep living in ghettos and we could just like kind of do whatever jobs we wanted to. But uh, yes, it did take 1,800 years at a, at a minimum. <laughs> depending on where you're looking at, Germany was a little late to the party. But this was also around the rise of nationalism, which was a new craze in Europe. And what happens every time there is a rise in nationalism? You're right. Yes, everyone else decides it's time to kill the Jews or get rid of us because we're foreigners and outsiders and not loyal. So yeah, lots of people fled to the US, including uh, the other half of my family. This also coincides with the Russian pogroms, which is the real reason my family came over here. And this kind of like also leads into the exploitation of the Jewish people as a scapegoat by the Nazis in the 1930s. And then we have the Holocaust. You know what's up. During this time, there became a rise in thinking that at the end to Jewish suffering could be attained by having our own nation. This all kind of came to a head with the Dreyfus Affair, which got a lot of Jews like, oh, fuck, we're not one of them, um, including Theodore Herzl, who he's like kind of the father of modern Zionism. And I talked about him in my Ella Emhoff video. So sorry for the extremely long history lesson, but I kind of think it's important to understand like what's actually been happening to Jewish people over the last 3000 years. Just the inherited trauma of it all. Zionism is the idea that Jews should have a homeland. Probably most Jews agree that that homeland should be in like our ancestral home of Israel. I feel like I have, I feel like I'm, I'm a little more on the liberal end, which is that it doesn't necessarily need to be in that location. I just like want one place where I won't get shot for being a Jew. Nowadays, the word Zionism has been loaded and co-opted by anti-Semites and well-meaning people alike to mean the state of Israel as it is today, which is not accurate, which includes their currently on trial for uh, corruption and bribery, Prime Minister Benjamin Buttface Netanyahu. That's not, that's not accurate. Um, however, there is literally a word that exists to describe that stance, which is anti-Israel. When you take the stance to be anti-Zionist, you're basically saying Jews don't deserve self-determination, despite that we're okay with nearly all other groups on the planet having that right. And there's a lot, a lot of reasons to be anti-Israel, but I think it's important to know that words mean things, you know, because there's a lot of problems with the current state of Israel, like mandatory military service, or their, need I say his name again, prime minister, to annexation, to their ineffective parliamentary system. And this is probably just the perspective of an American. Ew. Um, but yes, I am living in America. Maybe this is just my perspective because I've all, I've been living in America forever, but I feel like the idea of an ethno state, which is what Israel is, is inherently problematic. But at the same time, Jewish people as an ethno religion don't actually have any guaranteed, like, safe place to live outside of Israel, and I don't even think Israel is safe. Maybe that's just because as an Ashkenazi Jew, my life is ruled by fear. Like, I've been really trying personally to like parse out, is an ethnic state possible um, without being problematic? And I don't think it is, but especially like, not there. Mm -mm, not at this point. Too much time has passed. But essentially there's a huge difference between being anti-Zionist and being anti-Israel, the former of those is inherently anti-Semitic. Just like, please think about your word choice and whether or not you want to indicate to Jewish people that they 
will be safe around you. And to like wrap that up, Zionism is an idea of self-determination. Policies made by the current state of Israel, along with, um, boy oh boy do I not want to have to explain the Palestinian Authority and um, Hamas right now, but none of these three governing bodies are good at what they're doing. None of them. Not a single one. Most governments are bad, but these three are worse. People who would be good at governing the Middle East include no one. I'm thinking like probably my ideal person to bring peace to the Middle East would be like a transformer. No, you know what? I take it back. It has got to be Voltron. All of those guys and those weird, ugly lions, they might be able to do it, possibly. So to like get back to what I was trying to say, like the current state of Israel isn't doing a good job of like not screwing over Palestinians. Um, and by that I mean normal people living in the Palestinian territories. Not those governing bodies, we've already discussed this. Those governing people maybe deserve no rights. I, you did not hear it from me, folks. They're just doing such a bad job and normal civilians don't deserve to suffer like that. You can be more accurate in what you're trying to express um, if you were trying to express your discontent with the governing forces over there. To close this out without trying to do the mental gymnastics required to explain every intricacy of who is in charge over there because it's like five different governments, including the UN, and none of the, no one's doing a good job. But we can probably all agree Palestinians deserve the right to self-determination and probably Palestinians and Jews should be living side by side. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be not a very dangerous Ethnostate. My Americanness is coming through yet again. Sorry about it. Sorry about it. But to say you're anti Zionist means one group of people deserves self determination over another, whereas saying that you are anti Israel means that you are acknowledging the bad governance and the atrocities and all of the many, many, many bad things that they have done. There isn't necessarily like an equivalent, like, philosophy around Palestinian self-determination in the way that we've got that nice little buzzword of Zionism, but I just really want to make sure it gets hammered home that you're not doing what you think you're doing when you're saying that you're anti-Zionist. You are alienating Jewish people, and if you're a Jewish person who's an anti-Zionist, I um, am begging for you to go to therapy. Please. I know, controversial to say that everyone in a conflict deserves rights, but maybe they do. I know, I know. Hard to believe, but someone's gotta believe it, so I will be carrying that torch for all of us. Don't worry, you can, if you comment on this video, thank you for your service. <laughs> I'll know what you mean. <laughs> I hope you really enjoyed this, like, history lesson. Israel's old as fuck, and Jews and Palestinians both have been there for a really long time and probably should get to live there. I'm not gonna solve that problem because that sounds like a lot of work. And as Ali Wong said, I don't wanna work anymore. Thank you to Charlie for being the coolest and best of my current YouTube friends. I don't have any other YouTube friends. Charlie's my only <laughs> YouTube friend. So thank you, Queen. Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed this collab. I, it was very exciting to me. I usually just like text Sophie and Nicole and Elsa and I'm like, what do you think of this idea? And they're all like, we don't want to be on camera. You guys can go see uh, the collab on the Cringy channel. I will hopefully include a link as soon as that is done and is up. Anyways, go follow me. Go follow Charlie on all of our social media. It's all down below. You got it. You're good. Feel free to like or subscribe. But if you don't like or subscribe to Charlie, if you don't subscribe to Charlie, I will be very mad. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next time. Whoa, whoa, mama mia, here I go.